Hello, I'm Jen Wilson, Senior Programmer with Film Independent and Film Independent Presents. Welcome to this FI Presents Q&A for the new film, Delia's God by Robert Boudreaux. Special thanks to our lead sponsor, the HIFPA and Vision Media, who hosts all our virtual screenings and Q&As. And now please welcome director, Robert Boudreaux. Hi, Robert. Hello. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Thank you so much for talking about this film today. Um, I wondered, I wondered since we have a lot of members of Film Independent that are aspiring filmmakers, if you could talk about how you got started uh, as a filmmaker. Sure. Um, I mean, I think I got started in uh, a kind of the usual way on one hand in that, you know, I, I started by loving film growing up. I, I never really thought it was something that I could actually do. I thought it was just something you kind of saw. And I came from my parents were both uh, professionals. And so I never really imagined I could actually do that for a living. And then I kind of got exposed to the business. Um, and I thought, oh, man, this is like something people actually do. And so I started, you know, I went to film school. I went to film school out west in Vancouver, at the Vancouver Film School. And, uh, you know, made some film school shorts. And then I and then I went on to make some other little short films ranging from, you know, four minutes to, to kind of 10 minutes. And then I made kind of like a calling card short film, which was like a 22 minute film, which was shot on Super 35 at the time, which was all fancy. And then I made my first feature um, and that was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And so it was kind of just learning the craft, both through film school, the, the theoretical and the academic, but then also just making lots of shorts and just learning on the fly. So I think a fairly typical progression in that sense. So for this film, um, Daily is Gone, it's based on a short story by Michael Hamblin called Cage Bird Sing. What was it about this story that made you want to adapt it and make it into a feature? Well, I, I, I kind of love the, um, I, I'm, I grew up in a small town. Uh, I mean, I moved out when I was 18 or 19, whatever, to go off to, to university. But I, I've always loved kind of rural noir as, as, um, as a genre. And so I was attracted to this kind of Midwestern, small town American rural noir feel. And so I love that aspect of the story. Michael Hamblin is, is from uh, uh, Idaho. And so he certainly knows that, that small town world very well. And so, and I just love Lewis as a character. I thought on one hand, he's this, you know, flawed individual. And in the original short story, he was actually much older. I, I made him younger um, in the adaptation. But this idea of there's a kind of a, almost like a Steinbeckian mice or men quality to him where he's a flawed protagonist who has the potential for violence, the propensity for violence, but also like kind of a kind heart and he's kind of following a noble mission. And so I was just, I was quite attracted to that um, as a central character and then, and then just the world, that rural noir world around him. So, so talk about your actors in this. Um, let's start out with talking about Steven. Um, what was it that uh, made you want to cast him in this pivotal role of Lewis? I was a huge fan of his work in if Beale Street um, could talk his his uh, you know the, the which was the follow up um, Barry Jenkins follow up to Moonlight, and I was a big fan of his from Homecoming that he did the series with Julia Roberts, and so you know uh, I was just a, I was just a, like a, a real fan of his acting, and I also thought that these typically these kind of small town rural noirs. Um, so many of them, if you look at Hell or High Water or, or Fargo, and there's so many great kind of examples, they all tend to be very white uh, and, and they don't have a lot of diversity because, you know, politically in America, you know, middle America is more homogeneous, obviously, in, in certain ways. And so I was I was attracted to this idea as well of, of shaking up the genre in different ways. And I didn't want to I didn't want to make the film necessarily about race because that you can you know that is a different movie and there's elements of that here. But um, I also didn't want that to be a reason why I wouldn't cast someone like Stefan because he typically doesn't sit, you know, it's not 
these kinds of films typically aren't written uh, for, for black actors. And so I was quite excited by that and what it could bring to the film without completely steering it in a different direction. So there's a lot of reasons really. So uh, Stefan, do you pronounce his name Stefan or Steven? Stefan? Uh, Stefan, Stefan, Stefan James, yeah. Stefan James. He has to play a character who uh, has a developmental disability, which yes. he got from uh, an accident where he almost drowned. Uh, so like some brain damage, um, which can be really challenging for actors. Like what was it? Uh, how did you help him find this character of Lewis? Yeah, well, it, it, it is. It's obviously one of the real challenges, attractions, but also things that, that is scary and tricky about a role like this. Um, is and so you know the best thing to do is obviously do research and there's a, like in this day and age there is a wealth of research that, that can be done both online and in person and so we were able because the symptoms of kind of traumatic brain injury are often similar to um developmental disabilities on uh, various ends of the spectrum obviously sometimes like less serious ends of the spectrum but it's still it's similar to those and so you can look at those uh uh, symptoms and manifestations on the spectrum and use that as an analogy, even though it's technically a little different, they, they manifest similarly. And so he, he kind of used that and spent some time um, with some various um, autism groups and, and, and kind of looked at that. And, you know, to be honest, he did a lot of his own research too. Like I guided him, but it's one of the things I like to do. I like to give cast a certain amount of flexibility. We hired him early in the process. So he had a long lead up to, to do some research and decide how to how to approach that set, you know, because it's a very, it's a sensitive thing, obviously, to to handle correctly and, and to deal with. And so, um, like I said, it was both a challenge, but it was also one of the scarier things for us just to try to like get it right. So uh talk about casting Paul Hauser and Marissa Tomei, who are the cops in this, and mm. with with Marissa Tomei emerging <laughs> towards the end as our villain. Um yeah. <laughs> Did she enjoy getting to play a, a villain role in this film? I think so. I think Marissa's typically done certain types of things and she hasn't often done something like this. And so I find a lot of the great actors and she's one of them like to, um, they like to be challenged and try new things. And, and it's partly, uh, I think what attracted her to this was that she hadn't really done this before and people aren't used to seeing her in this. And so, she, I think she did quite enjoy just uh, that feel. And, you know, and Paul Walter Hauser, who, you know, I've loved him and Richard Jewell and an I, Tanya and a bunch of things. And he brings a lighter element, even, even when he's playing pretty straight. And so to me, he, he, you know, he's a nice foil to her and it's, it's an interesting match. And it, it, you know, it's a serious movie, but I find even serious movies need a certain amount of levity. And, and Paul is just such a naturalistic, brilliant actor. He was such a joy to work with. Yeah, uh, the the differences I, I found those characters, the relationship between them and the developing relationship between them to be like a very uh, interesting facet of the movie. Uh, what about working with Travis Fimmel, who most people know from Vikings, right? Of course, yeah. Travis was great. You know, he was in the stacker role. He was kind of you know in for a week, and he had a really busy week. But he 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 really he was fantastic, very, very, very down to earth and easy to work with, uh, brought a great intensity to the role. He's got such strong presence and eyes and, and, and focus. And, he, and I, I, I feel like he, he doesn't need to try that hard to kind of get across what we wanted with Stacker in this film, which is a, a man haunted by some guilt and by some choices. And, and, uh, and I just found him very believable and, and he was able to kind of bring a lot of himself to that, which is always nice. So, you know, that's always kind of what you want as an actor to bring something strong, but not have to like force it and work too hard. And so um, I was really lucky in terms of those four uh, as, as, a, as a cast. Well, there's other, there's other great actors involved too, but those were the kind of the four bigger leads. And then there's Janelle Williams and Hamza Hackens and some other great actors too. Uh, yeah, I found, I, you're you're totally right. His intensity in this it was great, and it feels really pivotal to pushing the story forward. You know the way in which he's not going to be 
he's obviously found the direction that he wants to go and he's not going to be diverted by anybody not wanting him to tell the truth. And I thought that was pretty beautiful to witness. Um, can you talk about the look of the film, um, planning the look of the film with your DP, Steve Cozens? Yeah. I shot a, an earlier movie called Born to be Blue, a jazz biopic, a Chet Baker jazz biopic with Steve. Um, and so we knew each other. Um, and Steve has is, is a great natural lighter. And we decided to shoot the film all handheld. Steve operates himself. Um, and so we wanted to give it a like a looser organic feel. And we tried as much as possible to use existing locations without like we obviously production designed it and set decked it, but we were trying for quite a naturalistic look because it's a contemporary film. Um, and I thought Steve did a wonderful job of 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 using natural light and not, not it's not all natural lighting. It's not like extreme in that sense, but um, and just giving us a certain flexibility with with um, with coverage, but also not trying to make it like it's not like a frenetic, fast paced handheld film. It's still a pretty quiet slow burn kind of feel but it's handheld and, and often steve's handheld is still very rock solid so you don't really want to notice it too much but you still feel there's something that's that's moving a little bit um and then palette wise i also didn't want to kind of wash it out and desatch it too much i find like that can become an overused trope now and so i wanted to let the film have a certain vibrancy uh and and color and 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 i tend to favor um kind of wider lenses a lot of close-ups you know are, are on some wider lenses so you feel close to the characters emotionally like you just as an audience feel close to them so um yeah that was kind of those were some of the basics of our of our approach to to the film uh one of the things that i loved was uh the choice of the song that lewis and delia sing together ring them golden bells which mm. I think we used to sing at my grandma's church when I would go to church with my grandma. I think we sang this song. It was so Sweet. familiar yeah. with me, for me. Yeah, it's, it's a so beautiful old song. The version that you chose uh, to go over the closing credits is by Southern Sons. But I noticed on Spotify, there's hundreds of versions of this song. Why yeah. did you pick that one in particular, which I thought was great. And I listened to it several times. Yeah, I mean, I thought the song was great in that it's got this kind of hopeful, redemptive quality, which at the end of the day is kind of the end goal of Lewis's mission, even though it gets dark and violent. And um, I think my editor, Jeff Ashenhurst, even in the assembly, had, had, had pulled different versions of the song and he had slapped it in there. And then I, I really kind of fell in love with it because it's, it's, it's kind of fun and unique. And, and the way that some of the old singers used to kind of harmonize what they could do with just their vocals is amazing. Yeah. And so I kind of, I fell in love with that. And then, you know, to me, it was like that song is, is a key motif in the film. And then there's the actual song Delia's Gone, which was originally by Blind Willie McTell and was, was covered by Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash. And I've always been a huge, huge Dylan fan. So I, I came to this story and song of Delia's Gone through Bob Dylan. Um, and I know that was also one of the inspirations for Michael Hamblin creating this. And, and if you look at songs of that era, like there's Delia's Gone, there's Stacker Lee, there's, um, uh, I forget, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the other one, but all the names of the characters like Lewis, Delia, Stacker, um, Billy Lyons, th those are all characters from folk songs of the 20s. And so there's this kind of like historic Americana folk song element uh, homage to all the characters and even the story of, of, a, of a young black girl being raped is, is what this song Delia's Gone is about. It's based on it. It was like a, the original song was based on a true story of a 14 year old black girl who was raped and that, that but that and uh, this is totally different but that there's still the spirit of that is still in this story I think. So you've made uh, have you made all of your projects in Canada? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've shot, I've shot them all in Canada for the most part. I've shot bits and bobs in other countries too, but they've kind of all been Canadian based and often uh, use some Canadian financing, some government support, and then other, you know, there's typically having American elements and Canadian elements. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, 
you've ever thought about the comparisons, but you know, between being an indie filmmaker trying to come up as a filmmaker in Canada versus the U.S. Have you ever thought about? Mm. I think some people have the perception that's a bit easier in Canada because of funding for the arts, but just wondering what mm. your thoughts are on that. Uh, I think in some ways it is easier because we have more support. Um, I mean, it's still hard. It's always still hard to kind of like get the government money here. A lot, I know a lot of Americans come up and think it's just like part of our tax credit. You can just get all this like free Canadian money. It's actually really hard and competitive to get it. But there is there is more opportunity to get it. And I think um, what often meet, what often happens is um, your your budgets can be a little bit bigger than they would otherwise be. Like, I mean, I, I could make the same, and it might, might in, in, in the US, which is more market driven, you might have to make the same movie for like two or $3 million. You can make it for like five in Canada because you have 30 or 40 or 50% of your budget covered by some government subsidy. And so that's, I think that's one of the differences is I so I, I do feel quite lucky on that front in that we have the support. But that being said, a lot of my movies are still pretty, cast driven which still means that to do them on the level i i, st I still need a certain amount of um they can't just be pure government supported movies they have to have pretty strong american elements too uh and or they're you know international co-productions a lot of my past movies were canada and europe or, or just various co-productions because then it allows you more uh, cast flexibility because sometimes if you're just making pure canadian movies there's a lot of rules around it how many Canadians you can cast, how many Canadians you can have, and that can become a little restricting. Um, and so, but I, I think it is probably a little easier. It's a nice advantage to have. Well, so the film comes out this Friday? August 19th, is that this Friday already? Oh, perhaps that's next week. That's eight days. Um, so, it's soon though it's coming yeah august 19th uh is it going to be in theaters and streaming or just theaters in the beginning just theaters is the plan in the in the beginning and then uh follow up on on streaming yeah well congratulations on on a great film uh we wish you the oh, best of you. luck with it and thank you so much for coming to talk with us today mm -hmm.